In this video, we will examine one of the most intriguing hypotheses related to the Chernobyl disaster. Imagine this. Chief Engineer Akamov does not command Topshinov to press the AZ-5 button, which was fatal for reactor number 4. Instead, he orders him to wait. What would have happened in this case? There are two points of view on this matter, and we will thoroughly dissect this question. Let's go back to the events of that fateful day and see what was happening to the reactor at that moment. Near the end of the power reduction program, the reactor had reached a critical point. In the minutes before the explosion, operators were trying to balance many factors, creating a potentially dangerous situation. Under normal conditions, water enters the RBMK core at about 265 to 270 degrees Celsius and exits at about 284 degrees Celsius, producing many vapor bubbles. On that fateful night, however, things were different. When power dropped at about midnight, there was a significant loss of water in the steam separators that had to be compensated for. In this video, we will examine in detail all the nuances of this hypothesis and try to understand what could have happened if Akamov had not given the command to press the AZ-5 button. We will also tell you how the events in the reactor developed in those minutes before the catastrophe and how the operator's actions influenced the course of events. Stay tuned to the end of the video to find out all the details of this intriguing story. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, put a like, and leave a comment with your opinion about it. Boris Stalyarchuk, the senior block control engineer, carried out multiple sudden increases in the feed water flow rate entering the steam separators to recover the lost water. This water, which was preheated to only 165 degrees Celsius, was much cooler and denser than the water already in the steam separators. As a result, it sank to the bottom of the separators and entered the core, causing a reduction in voids and a withdrawal of control rods. However, this cold water continued to cycle through the reactor core, causing the water approaching its boiling point to increase rapidly. Stalyarchuk performed this action twice, once shortly after 1 a.m. and again just minutes before the rundown began. This resulted in a significant amount of cold water further dampening the reactivity while also causing the water to approach its boiling point quickly. As a result, the temperature of the coolant water entering the core reached approximately 282 degrees Celsius, only 2 degrees away from the temperature of the water exiting the core. This led to an increase in the number of voids forming, causing the reactivity to rise due to the positive void coefficient. The automatic control rods were inserted to counteract this, but it was not enough to overcome the void coefficient. In the last few seconds before the AZ-5 button was pressed, the automatic control rods were approaching or at full insertion. However, even if the AZ-5 button was not pressed, the power would continue to rise due to the positive void coefficient. In fact, the positive void coefficient was estimated to be 50% higher than normal on that night, reaching values of 5 beta, which is equivalent to having so much positive reactivity that it goes prompt critical, the same technology that makes a fission bomb explode. There are two diverging claims about what would have happened if the AZ-5 button was not pressed, but both depend on the same process, the positive void coefficient. The behavior of the positive void coefficient is a complete enigma, especially on that night, and it played a significant role in the events leading up to the disaster. In January 1988, a scientific paper was published in Canada about the RBMK. First, you might be wondering why I'm mentioning this. However, scientists aren't unintelligent. Less than two years after the explosion, the West had already concluded that the modeling presented at Vienna was a lie. The positive scram effect, the raising reactivity being due to the control rods and not the rundown experiment itself was well understood. The paper decided to run a few scenarios. A simulation based on the Soviet data, which you may recognize as familiar if you watch my video on the Alexander Sit version of destruction. One where the positive void coefficient did not exist, meaning that the entirety of the power surge was caused just by control rod insertion. Their own model, which I'm ignoring because it doesn't correspond to reality, 
and one where no control rod insertion occurred and so no changes in reactivity from then. As you can see over these six seconds, the reactor power barely seems to increase over the duration of the image. So there's the answer, right? No power increase, the reactor remains stable, and eventually it could be scrammed by just inserting a few control rods at a time. But this is a lie. The y-axis of the graph is logarithmic. It begins at just over 15% of reactivity, and when it concludes, it is about halfway up, so about 30% of maximum reactivity. This is a doubling of the reactivity. The COR voids are still forming, but it appears to be slow, and the reactor appears to be bringing itself stable regardless. This is the camp where a few people fall into. The reactor would eventually level out and stabilize without exploding. However, what some of you may have noticed is that the reactivity here is doubling in six seconds. This means an automatic scram due to a low period in the reactor, and Chernobyl 4 blows itself up anyway. But assuming it didn't, then we have Camp 1 here. You may also be wondering, does this graph keep going forward in time? The answer is, of course, yes. We're starting fine, power is slowly increasing, and then at 12350, well, it doesn't look very good. Reactor power reaches a huge spike of 240% and then immediately reverses back down to 140% as the high negative temperature coefficient of the reactor would have reversed the reactivity back down before spiking again. And again, the two coefficients, the negative temperature coefficient and the positive void coefficient thought to balance each other out and reach a stable reactivity. Such a climb in reactivity would be much smaller, of course, compared to the real-life situation where it approaches 100,000% reactivity, and temperatures would only break 670 degrees Celsius compared to the thousands of degrees evident in damage to the core today. What does this mean? Well, the upper biological shield, despite being this absolutely massive structure, could have been displaced by just three or four simultaneous fuel channel ruptures, and that means another Chernobyl disaster. But in this scenario, with lower temperatures and pressures, that many fuel channel ruptures would probably not occur. And with the diesel generators almost fully started up and switched on to power the pumps according to the rundown program, we have a new factor to consider, the sudden influx of coolant water. These series of power surges are dependent wholly on the positive void coefficient alone and a sudden influx of coolant water would almost immediately collapse the voids and, in fact, reduce the reactivity inside the core. No matter what, the reactor is going to suffer a lot of stress, damaged channels, potentially cracked graphite blocks, and a lot of fuel that will need replacement. Someone would have definitely been punished for it, like Vaslav Brajin, who was scapegoated for the Unit 1 accident and replaced with Anatoly Dyatlov. So there are the two hypotheses. Either the reactor remains relatively stable and a big emphasis on the relative, or there is a smaller power surge brought down by an influx of cold water that will then bring power back down to safer levels. In either case, an automatic scram signal would have almost certainly been triggered, blowing up the reactor anyway. But if there wasn't, not pressing the AZ-5 button could have, in fact, saved Chernobyl. I would like to express my appreciation to those who suggested this topic for a video and voted for it in my recent poll. This question, which is addressed in today's video, played a crucial role in debunking the Soviet narrative of the events decades ago. So, kudos to you for contributing to the exploration of the truth behind the disaster through history and science. Thank you for watching my videos. Truly means a lot to me. Farewell.